Okay, so um, my name is Kyle. I'm here to introduce Professor Rafael Calvo. He's uh, here to talk to us about positive computing. Um, he is the director of the Positive Computing Lab at the University of Sydney, and along with Dorian Peters, who's in the audience here, uh, co-author of a book about positive computing. And we actually have a limited number of copies of those available outside for the $10 subsidy. So um, please take advantage of that. Um, so in addition to uh, the Positive Computing Lab work, he's the co-director of the Software Engineering Group, focusing on mental health, medicine, and education. He has a PhD in artificial intelligence, and in addition to being an expert on positive computing, he's uh, done significant work on effective computing, learning systems, and web engineering. So um, please join me in welcoming Professor Calvo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Kyle. Uh, as you said, I'm from the University of Sydney. This was the first university in Australia. Nowadays, it has about 50,000 students and just over 7,000 staff. Uh, Sydney has a very strong relationship with the beaches and the natural beauty across the country, as you might know. You might also know about um, its reputation for sports and some of the iconic buildings, like the Opera House there, that was finished in 1973. Now, back then in the 1970s, most people were foreign to digital experiences, both here in, in the US, uh, in Australia, everywhere else. Um, only in the 1980s, uh, digital experiences began to get into our homes through personal computers and uh, gaming consoles. In the 1990s, those clunky mobile phones started becoming smaller, cooler, and more common. And then these mobile phones started being able to do more than just making phone calls. Now, in just the last five years, digital experiences have begun, become part of everything we do, from work, business, friendships, relationships, romance. And one critical question remains. Uh, all these digital experiences, are they making us any happier? Uh, is all this effort, all this investment, all these carbon emissions having an impact on our overall well-being? Incredibly, according to the statistics, it isn't. It's not having an impact. Population surveys for the last 50 years or so show that wealth and therefore also digital devices and experiences have quadrupled in some countries, yet well-being has hardly changed. Now, as an engineer, I have to ask myself, if technologies are being developed to improve people's lives, why is the correlation so low? So we have, over the last few decades, been, design, been designing for um, things like productivity, efficiency, accuracy, speed, uh, and so on. And only very recently, we have begun to work on things like satisfaction, pleasure, desire. Productivity has always played a starting role. Productivity is generally easy to measure, it's easy to design for, and uh, it, computers in general began as a tool for work. But now this has gone way beyond this. Now computers are in every aspect of our moment to moment lived experience. Now they see in us track, measure, compare, judge, everything we do from the number of steps we walk, the miles we run, the uh, friends we have, uh, even the number of times we make love. Yes, there is enough for that. So we measure literally everything. This has created what we see as a tyranny of productivity that makes it all the more difficult to focus on one thing at a time to be mindful, so I love the, that this week is the mindfulness week here in Google, uh, to pause, to disconnect, to pay attention to quality over quantity, to uh, take the time to be kind, uh, compassionate towards other people, etc. All things that are very well known to be critical to well-being. In other words, we have been designing for proxies. We design for things like productivity, wealth, pleasure, because we think those things will make us happier, live a better life. But now we know from psychology that those are not very good proxies. The correlation of those things with happiness is not that high. 
So we have been designing for all these proteins, but we have not been designing directly for the thing that matters most. So if we want to change or develop technologies that increase worldwide well-being, we have to design for well-being directly, directly. In fact, we believe that all technologies, all the products that Google develops, all the products that all the software industry develops, all digital experiences should be designed to support psychological well-being. And this is what we call positive computing, the research and development of technology to support well-being and human potential. And that's a kind of a shameless plug for our book here with Orion Peters. Now, when I give a talk to engineers, I'm not sure how many of you are engineers here? Okay, the majority. The first thing that people tend to ask is that something that we can study scientifically? Is that something that we can actually measure? Well, uh, yes, you can measure it, and there are many different ways of doing so. I'm going to be covering some of them uh, today. Um, psychologists and particularly um, behavioral economists have been working on many different methodologies that can use, you can use to measure well-being. Uh, but what, first, what I want to do is to review a little bit about how technologies are changing us. And then I will tell you some of the different disciplines that can contribute to different ways of measuring well-being. We can, uh, and then I will tell you a little bit about our own projects. So we know our brains are adapting to technology. Technology is changing the way we remember things. Technology is changing the way we relate to each other. Technology is even changing the way that we understand ourselves. So the ubiquity of digital devices means that digital experiences are slithering their way into every aspect of our life, every aspect that psychologists know influence our psychological well-being. Obviously, the relationship between uh, technology and well-being is very, very complex. And there's a lot of research in this area, particularly around social uh, networking frameworks. So um, I have chosen here a number of papers that talk about this complexity. So there are hundreds of papers. Some of them talk about how social networking um, decline, produce declines in subjective well-being. Otherwise, have focused on emotional contagion. Other ones that I consider some of the more nuanced approaches, uh, like the, the work by, by Moria Burke, uh, look into or have seen that the impact really depends on what you're doing with those tools. Uh, these uh, papers show uh, about the impact. There are other ones, like The Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind by Killingsworth, that talk about the new tools that we can use to measure well-being. So that one in particular uses mobile phone technologies to use experience sampling. And what they did is they had 5,000 participants and they asked people, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? And how do you feel? The first very interesting outcome was that up to 50% of the time, we are thinking about something else to what we're doing. So roughly, Maybe half of you might be thinking about something else than my seminar. The other interesting outcome is that it doesn't depend on the quality of my seminar. It doesn't depend on the quality of our experience. Our mind wanders no matter what we're doing, okay, for all type of day-to-day -day activities. Even in making love, people were distracted or thinking about something else up to 30% of the time. Um, so this is one of the many tools that we can use to understand uh, people's experiences. And if you thought that 5,000 people was a large number, think about the other experiment here, 61 million participants. That was a Facebook study that showed that different user interfaces can change the way people uh, seek information and vote. And this was done in the 2010 congressional election. So the impact on behavior and on people's experiences is huge. Now, there are many different techniques that we can use to under understand people's experiences. 
Uh, I and a lot of people in the human computer interaction community have worked on something we call cognitive computing. It's trying to understand what people think. And uh, we particularly have been working for a few years on uh, technologies uh, around writing, particularly academic writing. One of the cool things about writing, studying writing, is that when people write, it's very hard for them to be thinking about something else. So within that, what we have been doing is working, developing concept maps, summaries, different type of tools and visualizations that help us understand that. And then those are feedback interventions that we can give writers for them to reflect on what they write. Now, one of the best things that we can do to help people is to provide feedback, but it's very challenging to understand the impact of that feedback, to know which is the best type of feedback. So we have using behavioral analytics tools and visualizations like in this study. So I, here, uh, different roles are different writers. Each of these green balls is a writing session. So you can see there's people that spend more time writing, other people that spend less time writing. And then we have um, two types of interventions. So the triangles are reflective feedback and the squares are directive feedback. So in one type of feedback, we tell the person there's something wrong in what you wrote. And in the other one, we say there's something wrong. This is what you should do to fix it. The cool thing with these tools is that then you can uh, track and see if people is reading the feedback, if people is going and addressing the feedback, how much time they spend addressing the feedback, and so on. Uh, the third type of techniques that we are using is affective computing, so detecting emotions. Uh, in this case, we have uh, facial expression recognition. So the, the writer is working there, and you can detect if the person is being bored, confused, uh, delighted, etc. Here's another plug. That's our Odds for Handbook of Affective Computing that was also released last month. And that brings research literature from the whole discipline. So the 50 chapters cover everything in, in the area of affective computing. The sec uh, second thing that we're doing with these tools is uh, looking at how they can be used in training. This is in medical education, so we're using it in telehealth, uh, trying to help future doctors uh, connect better to patients, interact better to patients through telehealth systems. So the system uh, detects basic emotions and acknowledgement expressions. So it could be nodding and shaking, turn taking, etc. And you can use different modalities, not just computer vision. In this video, we have an intelligent tutoring system that is teaching the person about information technologies, and it will ask questions and the person replies. So what you see there on the top is the, what the person sees on the screen. And he's plugged to a number of physiological sensors, and you can... Um, sensors are faster and more efficient than CISC processors. RISC has a reduced instruction set which presents fewer bottlenecks in processing. Also, RISC processors can execute multiple instructions simultaneously. Let's go on to something else. Take a close look at these four pictures. So here what you can see is the different physiological signals are being used, use machine learning techniques, to detect the different uh, emotions and the system can then be adapted to what the person is feeling. If the person is feeling confused, you might give him more explanations. If the person is bored, you can raise the challenge of the questions. Uh, now, if we have new techniques that allow us to understand people's cognitions, people's behaviors, and people's emotions, shouldn't be we be using this to improve well-being? Uh, and this is the, the new field. I think it's a very interdisciplinary field that we call positive computing. So the disciplines include, of course, all the ones from psychology and brain sciences. Computing, there's a lot of work being done in the area of obviously affected computing, personal informatics, persuasive technologies, attentive technologies. Um, very interestingly, there is some work in education and a lot of work on behavioral economics on well-being. And finally, in design, human-computer interaction, value-sensitive design, et cetera, uh, people there have been working on this. Now, this is a highly interdisciplinary area. So we, when we were writing the book, we sought advice from experts in those different disciplines who wrote cyber. So here we have people from positive psychology and emotional intelligence. Um, maybe the most commonly used um, instrument to measure well-being 
is the uh, DSM, uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Depression Scale, the CSD Depression Scale, Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale. Um, these are small questionnaires that are considered so reliable, for example, by insurance company, that if you score very high on those um, surveys, the insurance company is willing to pay for your treatment. In this model, depression or the absence of depression means you are doing well. That's a definition of well-being, the absence of illness. Uh, positive psychology is a movement that arose from the critics of this uh, clinical model. Um, people like Martin Seligman, Sonia Lumorsky, Felicia Huppert, they were focusing on looking at the factors that we can use to identify those people that are flourishing, that are very high in the well-being scale. Uh, and then in studying how those factors can be promoted across population. Uh, one of these factors, or set of factors, will be the social-emotional intelligence. This is something that people in human resources in business has focused a lot, but also in psychology. And looking at uh, how being able to recognize our own emotions and regulate them, how being able to recognize other people's emotions and regulate them, um, and maintain relationships, how all those skills help us have live better lives, uh, be more productive, etc. But mostly about well-being. Some of these factors also include uh, in self-determination theory, in other theories, things like autonomy, competence, connectedness. And um, generally, different uh, psychological theories will have different factors. Another approach that has been taken, especially by economists, like Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, has been to follow subjective well-being, ask people about their subjective, about their personal experience. Uh, of course, asking people directly what they think sometimes uh, is uh, troublesome, but using experience sampling and other techniques that have been developed in, in economists, by economists and psychologists, you can get a quite accurate measure over a period of time. Another approach is obviously using neuroscience. Uh, people like Richard Davidson, for example, has been studying the impact of mindfulness training on the brain. So you can see how when you promote certain factors, you can see how that change your brain over a period of time. So different psychological theories will contribute to our understanding of the, these different factors, autonomy, connectedness, competence, meaning positive emotions, engagement, etc. Now, as a human computer interaction, I don't have to become a psychologist, although obviously we need to work with them. We can uh, combine some of these different factors, some of these different theories, and look into how we can use them into our own designs. Um, economists, as I was saying, have been using measures of well-being significantly. Uh, the World Happiness Report, for example, provides a summary of the statistics across the world. This is uh, something that is done frequently. Last one, I think, was 2012. In the United Kingdom, uh, the government actually has a special unit that goes on surveys and measures well-being across the country. And here, there, you see a map, and the different regions are mapped and measured, and they use this in policy making. So they make decisions on where to invest government money, tax money, depending on the impact it has on well-being. And this has been done across Europe as well. In the US, rather than government, a lot of the initiatives are commercial. The Gallup Healthways uh, survey is done actually every day. So they have the cohort. You can go to a website, and they give you measures of well-being in different regions done daily. So all these are different ways of measuring subjective well-being. Um, and we have used um, experience utility. Those are the measures introduced by Daniel Kahneman. Um, other people, you can also use experience sampling techniques, like the study I mentioned on mind wandering. Nowadays, we can start using affective computing techniques to automatically detect things like engagement, to understand better about people's emotions, et cetera. So you don't have to be interrupting users that often. Now, of course, we are talking here about well-being promotion, 
many mental health professionals, as the ones that we work with, have to understandably be focusing on mental illness. But in this diagram by Felicia Huppert, I think it's very interesting because it shows how moving the mean uh, can improve uh, well-being across the population. So it can increase the number of people who are flourishing and reduce the number of people who have a mental disorder. So that we should be using the technologies, the approaches uh, for mental health promotion uh, in the design of all our technologies. Um, this is, I think, where technologies can have the most impact. And to design for um, well-being, we could look into the different factors that psychologists have identified. These are some of the ones that we cover in the book. Um, they are covered there in more detail. And for each of them, we have looked into the literature that shows that they are correlated, strongly correlated, or have an impact on well-being. And there are a number of interventions that have shown to be successful in improving each of these. So, for example, in positive emotions, it's probably the one that we most focus, focus most often in human-computer interaction. Uh, designers generally talk about delight, pleasure, and fun to describe <coughs> the design briefs. Now, generally, when we talk about pleasure, fun, etc., we do it because we know that it will make uh, the, um, the products sell more, people will spend more time on the websites, etc. Uh, there is very little research looking at the effect, the impact of positive emotions in long-term well-being. Some of that is done, by, for example, by Jane McGonigal, who has looked at the impact of the positive emotions triggered by games, etc., and personal change. Don Norman has worked a lot of on emotional design and the impact of how we can use positive emotions. Um, so both of them also have contributed to, to the book. Another area that we have uh, worked on is how you can use technologies to develop empathy. Often here it's about role-playing games, like in this one, the Frontiers game, that allows you to play either the side of a person escaping Africa, a refugee into Europe, or the side of a policeman whose job is to stop uh, these people. Or this other one, the Peacemaker game, that you can play the role of the Prime Minister of Israel or Palestine. And you can see how they, what is the impact of your decisions. Uh, and they have gone through so many phases and decision making there that they, actual have, they have actual video that shows when you take this decision, this is what happens. Um, developing altruism, uh, here, uh, in Stanford, Jeremy Bylinson, for example, has worked a lot on interventions that can help people become more altruistic and um, more helpful towards others. So in this experiment, he allows you to play either the side of Superman, so you go flying around the city trying to find a kid who needs help, or you fly around the city, but your character is just in a helicopter just doing a tourist trip around the city. And then something happens when you come out of the lab, a person has kind of an emergency, and they measure how much people help. And the people who have played Superman's role is much more likely to help, and they spend more time helping uh, the person at need. Um, we can introduce this in everyday software designs. I think praise Praise is such as an important element in our relationship with others. And in online systems, we can actually tend to optimize too much through usability. So if you look at the design of uh, LinkedIn, and you probably have seen the endorsements feature there, it's so easy to endorse other people for whatever skill that it becomes meaningless. Because I have been endorsed for Microsoft Word. Right? It's like, uh, what does it mean? What does it mean when you endorse someone else? And the problem is that we have made it so efficient, so easy to endorse other people that people just do it. Now, uh, Yammer does a much better uh, job because you have to explain. Explain why you are praising someone else. And because of efficiency, we are actually missing the opportunity of helping the two sides. 
On the one hand, the person who is helping, and on the other, the, the person obviously who receives the help or the praise. So uh, what we have been doing is working with organizations like Google and others, uh, looking into how we can introduce positive computing approaches into the development of everyday software. And we look at, we call them the happy camper factors, uh, because it's just to remember the acronym. So you have competence, autonomy, meaning, positive emotions, engagement, and relatedness. Okay? This is a combination from self-determination theory and from PERMA, that is an, one of the most popular positive psychology uh, theories. Uh, and these factors have shown to be effective in promoting well-being, and there are interventions that we know work uh, in promoting, the, uh, promoting them. I, I'm not going to go through the details of each of them, uh, but the important thing here is that software engineers can go and look at the impact this has on their trade-offs, on their designs. And the way you can do that is you can use those as hypotheses, and then you can do different designs and do A-B testing and see which one has a, a positive impact on any of those factors. So when you introduce a new product, you see, oh, okay, I changed the interface for Google Drive. Is it increasing people's sense of autonomy or is it decreasing it? Do people feel that they are more in control of the outcomes or are they, they feel they are less in control of the outcomes of what is happening? And studies have used different approaches to measure the impact of the designs of well-being. Uh, on this study, for example, uh, by people at Facebook detecting emotional contagion, they looked into um, how emotions propagate through a social network. And they used a very nifty statistical technique. So it was not an experimental design. They used weather. So obviously, our emotions do not influence weather, but we are influenced by the weather. Okay? So if you have a friend in Australia and you're, he's enjoying nice weather, he will influence your emotions okay? uh, through the social network. So that's a, a really interesting outcome. Well, one, we already know people are happier on weekends and sunny days, and they use that fact. Uh, but also, happiness spreads more than negative emotions. Positive posts decrease the number of negative emotions, 1.8, while negative post, a negative post by one of your friends decreases 1.26, the positive ones. <clears throat> Another uh, design, the most controversial, uh, because used an experimental uh, approach, was this other study by Facebook that you might have read, uh, and also was looking into how emotions propagate through the social network. So in this case, they had a negativity reduce design where the filter in the news feed uh, show fewer news stories from your uh, contacts. And in another one, there's a positivity reduce. So they show fewer um, uh, positive posts from your contacts. And this, you might have read it, it was a very controversial study um, because uh, it raised issues about ethics uh, if companies should have different obligations, ethical obligations. Um, I personally think that it raised an issue of the value of autonomy uh, in design because people felt that they wanted to have been able to change the filter. Um, and there's also a technical issue is the things, are the things that we say online a sign of empathy or compassionate distress? Is it always about our own emotions? So the interpretation of the data also is um, something that could be debated. So we have been looking at four different ways of introducing positive computing in design. The first one, well, the first one is actually not positive computing. That is what we mostly do when we are developing software. So we do not consider well-being. The second one is what I will call preventative integration. So if you have an application and there's a lot of trolling or antisocial behavior, you do a, a new design to try to reduce the antisocial behavior. Okay? So basically the obstacles or problems are considered like a bug where you, and you go and fix them. 
The next one is what I will call active integration. This is where we go and introduce new features that, we'll, that we think will promote certain factors. So we could go and introduce a new uh, word processor that promotes flow, okay? That has fewer distractions around. So the person is just concentrated in what is task, in that particular task, less mind wandering. Uh, another one could be a social media, a Google Plus, that promotes social intelligence, emotional intelligence. Finally, and maybe this is the one that has received the most attention, is what I would call dedicated integration. So this is when you build an app specifically for developing, let's say, mindfulness training, goal setting. So the app, the whole app is just dedicated to that. And here, you don't have to read the whole detail. It's mostly a summary of the factors that we have taken into account. Each of them has a theory, and each of them have proven strategies that have shown to work in developing um, that factor. And there are methods and measures that you guys can use. These are questionnaire surveys that have already been tested for reliability, et cetera, by psychologists. And many of them you can just go and use and see if that one is having an impact, for example, in building resilience, building motivation and engagement, et cetera. And then we divided them in self, social, and transcendent. Self are those factors that have to do just with you, are internal, things like mindfulness and mindfulness week. Social are the ones that depend on uh, more than one person or a relationship with others. And finally, transcendent is those that depend that where we care about other people with whom maybe we don't have a relationship, things like compassion and altruism. There are strategies for each of them that we can use and have been proven by psychologists. And we should be introducing more of those into our applications. So again, we have gone and asked others, because this is such an interdisciplinary world, we have asked experts in other disciplines to provide, contribute their personal, professional opinions on how we can support well-being. Uh, and these are some of them. And some of them are collaborating with us in a number of projects. In this one is with the Young and Well Cooperative Research Center in Australia, uh, reachout.com, uh, that is a mental health organization for young people. And what we're doing here is helping moderators in these social uh, networks uh, who have to go read posts written by other people, detect people that might be at risk, and answer questions. So these are things, issues on relationships, coming out, um, sexuality. These are young people um, that are seeking help. And what we are trying to do is to help the moderators be able to reach out to more people, um, be more efficient, but also enjoy uh, and find more meaning in the work. Um, in this work, we use, obviously, we collaborate a lot with psychologists, psychiatrists from Brain and Mind Research Institute and from these other institutions. So what we do here is um, we automatically go and grab the data from their social media platform. We process it automatically using machine learning algorithms, and we can classify what the post is about. Is a person depressed? Is a person anxious? Is he seeking help? And then we can automatically generate some interventions that are psychologically informed. So it could be a cognitive behavioral therapy type intervention. It could be a psychoeducation type information, uh, intervention. And the moderator goes, sees the templates, what we have generated, that is personalized with information about the particular individual, and they can customize it. So a lot of these moderators are people that have lived experiences, who have themselves uh, suffer from depression, anxiety, etc. And then, so, so they can contribute that to the other person. There's a lot of human contact. And then the moderator changes it, and it can go back to the users. So, um, well, this is a moderator assistant. And again, what we're trying to do is use one factor here that is compassion. It's trying to help the moderators help other people. In another two projects, we are working with young people in one that um, have cystic fibrosis or so diabetes type 1, 
and in the other one that have asthma. And in, what the two projects have in common is that we are trying to find ways in which we can promote autonomy. Doctors, medical professionals call this self-management of the disease. So they're looking for new ways in which patients can go out and uh, do what it's needed to do without having to remind them uh, all the time and controlling them. So it's self-management of the disease. So we are looking for new ways of doing that using mobile phone and other technologies. Uh, another project we are studying now is in the workplace, so particularly male, in male-dominated industries. Males have a particular risk, mental health risk profile, often because we don't go and seek help when we, when we need it. Uh, we are working with the police department, the fire department, and ambulance services in New South Wales, in, in Australia, looking at how we can detect people at risk and then provide them with services help that they might need. Um, another project that we have been working on is the, uh, a new fellowship that is basically coming and talking with organizations here like Google, trying to um, collaborate, find ways in which we can inform engineers, developers in the different industries on how to develop software that takes into account psychological well-being, how it takes into account all the factors that we just mentioned. Um, and this obviously requires talking with people from multiple disciplines, not just engineers or psychologists in the company, but people in other organizations like mental health, charities, etc. So just as a summary, we know that technology is changing us. There are psychological factors we know increase well-being. And these factors often, very often, can be used and introduced into the design of the platforms we build. And they will be promoting well-being. And positive computing provides a framework to support well-being by uh, considering this kind of multidisciplinary work and targeting the promotion of flourishing in, in the software platforms. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I've asked myself a lot is, um, when we go back to the first graph that you showed us right at the beginning about how gross uh, national pr product has increased, Yep. But um, some measure of happiness is not, right? So uh, so there are two, whenever I've looked at graphs like that, I've always had two questions. Um, a, is the gross national, pro, uh, the has the GNP accounted for inflation? And B, are there actually examples of graphs where life satisfaction has increased and not reverted back to a mean, right? So I was hoping to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, very good question. Um, yes, the first one, economists are very aware of how to take into account inflation and so on. Um, we have become wealthier, a lot wealthier, uh, some people more than others, but uh, in general, across society, societies in both poor and developed countries have become much, much wealthier. Um, the second one is related to something that's called hedonic treadmill, maybe that you have heard. And that there is some evidence that after you enjoy, you buy something that gives you positive emotions, let's say you buy a, a new mobile phone and you enjoy it, and after a little while, the new gadget you bought means, doesn't mean much, and your positive emotions go down. And then you seek the next, the next product. Now that refers to hedonic well-being, that is only the positive emotions aspect, the ephemeral uh, aspect of well-being. And that's why there is many other factors that support well-being, not just positive emotions. Meaning, if you find meaning in what you do, that will have a positive impact across your life. Not just, it's not going to fade away after a few days. Uh, if you find uh, if you involve yourself in helping others, others be it in a compassionate or altruistic, or an, if you work for a non-for-profit, that will have a positive impact on your life beyond the one or two days. So there are ways of changing 
um, that kind of baseline that it spans for it, all your life or for an extended period of time. So there are obviously a lot of subtle software and user interface issues here. Um, I'm wondering if also, I mean, the way that we interact with these devices, I mean, we hold them and touch them and uh, look at them and we talk to them and they talk to us and they measure our physiological functions and so forth. And, you know, from a sort of McLuhan-esque point of view, you might think that th the actual physical interactions that we have with these devices might also have a pretty s profound, I mean, you know, regardless of the details of the interface, uh, just the basic interactions with these things might have an impact on our, our well-being. And I wonder if there's any data available even tentatively on that. The research, for example, on using internet on viewing TV, the numbers of TV hours, is very complex. So I've seen papers where it says that if you have a TV, you will, have, you will increase your well-being. And there are studies that obviously show exactly the opposite. And then there are studies that show if you have the TV and you have internet, uh, your decrease goes down. And sometimes, no, if you have the two together, uh, it goes up. Um, I think we still have to work on the methodologies to measure that. Some of those studies are a little bit also the, the approaches that you have for tracking and understanding what people is doing with those devices has changed. Um, so I don't have a, a simple answer. I think there is studies. Uh, in general, they, they are very uh, s subtle differences that can have a, a, an impact. No? Uh, and you really have to go into the details of the study to see you know, what is happening. I think with the new techniques that we have to track people's use of these devices, then we will have a better way of doing, you know, of understanding what's happening. So for many years, we've brought people into labs, we've stuck stuff to them, we've pointed cameras at them and et cetera to sort of understand these things when we ever bothered to look. Um, which wasn't very often. Um, now that these things are, you know, they're mobile, we, people are over the planet, you can't bring them into study, they're using devices that, you know, like the, the Fitbits and other things and all kinds of stuff, and I'm sort of wondering how do we, you know, what are the, what are the emerging um, technologies and approaches to handling this multi-device world in which we're trying to understand the technology impact on wellness and happiness? I think that uh, when we are developing these new gadgets, like the Fitbit, um, the different technologies for activity tracking, they, have a, they can have a very positive impact on improving health and possibly well-being. On the other hand, you, you have to take into account psychological well-being that sometimes is different to the physical one, and see what is if it's not creating or triggering different consequences on different people. So if you're obsessive compulsive, you might be more inclined to use a particular tool that tracks everything, etc. The tool is not necessarily helping you come out of this pattern that you have, that it might be as likely to be affecting your well-being. So sometimes we take we do studies where we assume the whole population well receive these new tools in the same way. But you have people that have the different personal attributes and will react to them in different ways. And I think the devices that you're thinking about, like the Fitbit, etc., sometimes we look for general solutions, design approaches that will apply to everybody. And different people will have different impact. If you have um, an eating disorder, if you are focusing on weight too much, the impact can be negative. Maybe for the majority, the average maybe is moving positive, but then maybe you might be affecting people who need it most in a negative way. So um, I guess what I'm going to do there is that we need to look at the different groups of people, personalization. And when you design, consider ways of not designing in a general way, but also taking into account minorities, for example, people that might be um, at risk of mental health problems that might be at risk of um, yeah. um, 
physical problems, etc. Uh, yeah. That was an issue, for example, that arose in that controversial study by Facebook. People argue, well, there's a, a, a number of people that have mental health problems. So if you are driven or pushing them towards uh, more negative emotions, that can have very ne serious consequences. I can see as uh, thinking of an organization like Facebook or Google or some a company that's not Fitbit, not directly trying to create software that's going to increase some aspect of well-being. Um, I can see a strong incentive for uh, I forget your exact term, reactive uh, design for well-being. You know, you don't want trolls on your service, for instance. Um, what are the incentives? Do they exist right now for companies to take an active interest in increasing well-being, even if that's the, not the main purpose of their product? Uh, yeah, that's a fantastic qu uh, question. I think yes. Um, in Europe, in Australia, in many countries, just to give you an example, organizations are liable for mental disabilities, like caused by stress, for example. Um, and they have initiated a number of well-being programs. So there's hundreds of companies that are looking at providing servicing the industry that helps those organizations reduce the likelihood of having people burn out, etc. Now, you guys build the software that those companies are building to serve uh, the employees, right? So if you can build software that you show reduces the likelihood of burnout, if you design a new type of email system that reduces the likelihood of people um, working late hours, that has a strong impact on mental illness, you know, that's a fantastic sales point. I think uh, I will love and I, I will be willing to pay extra if I have software that I knew will help my kids grow up as stronger individuals, as more compassionate individuals, a software platform that allow them to be, have more emotional intelligence. And if they are relating to others through social media, you know, if they use Google+, Plus, if they use Facebook, if they use any of those products to connect and learn about other people's emotions, about uh, interacting with other people, those platforms need to include the things that psychologists know, promote uh, pro-social behaviors, promote empathy, promote compassion, promote, you know, uh, as, as a consumer, I will look for that type of uh, product. As a person that works in a large organization, I know my organization would like to uh, know of products that can offer that. And there's already companies that are doing that. Uh, Yammer, for example, has a number of companies that are providing um, services that allow organizations to understand what is happening internally. Like when a manager changes a policy, you can see, well, this is what has happened, the emotional state of the organization changed. Or it uh, has activities for people to engage, improving the, the connection between the, the <coughs> employees. Uh, let's thank uh, Professor Caldwell again. Thanks.